All right, in the last video, we looked at how given a transfer function of a discrete time linear system, you could kind of approximately sketch the amplitude response or phase response of that system as a function of the pole in zero locations. You can also think of that as a simple way to design filters. If there's an approximate amplitude response shape that you'd like, whether that's a low pass filter or a high pass filter, you can now go place poles and zeros in the complex plane to try to estimate or ballpark that uh, desired shape. So in some ways, that's kind of our first simple filter design approach. We're going to look at some more rigorous design approach in the subsequent videos before we get to those kind of rigorous filter design techniques. Let's go ahead and just give a few comments about the different types of filters one can design. So first of all, in general, we usually classify filters broadly into two different types. Some books like to use the words recursive or non-recursive, so those are two different classes or types of filters. Similarly, um, people call those either IIR, infinite impulse response, or FIR, finite impulse response filters. So recursive is synonymous with IIR, and non-recursive is synonymous with FIR. I'm gonna stick with the IIR and FIR nomenclature here because that helps me remember exactly what those are a little bit better. So let's talk about what IIR filters are and FIR filters are in general. So first let's tackle the infinite impulse response filter type. And let's do it just way of an example so you can kind of see what I mean by that. Let's say that I have a transfer function given by this. And usually when we have transfer functions, you know, there's a numerator in Z on the numerator and a polynomial in Z on the denominator. So H of Z is almost always some ratio of polynomials. We know how to take a transfer function in the Z domain and go back to the time domain to write that system in the time domain as a difference equation. If you don't remember how to do that, I have plenty of videos previously in this course that tell you exactly how do you do that. If you do that for this particular example, go from the Z domain back to time, you can end up with this difference equation right here, which relates the output of the system, Y of K, to the input of the system, F of K. Some books use X of K for the input. The text I like to use for this class uses F of K, so I'm using that notation right here. By looking at this difference equation, you can see what happens. At any time K, my current output is a function of inputs. It's a function of what's coming in right now, what came in one sample ago, what came in two samples ago, and what came in three samples ago. So it's a function of current and past inputs. It's also a function of past outputs. Y of K minus one is what came out of the system one time stamp ago. Y of K minus two is what came out two units of time ago. And Y of K minus three is what came out of the system three units of time ago. So for this particular example, we see that our output right now is a function of both current inputs, past inputs, and past outputs. That's why we call this a recursive filter, because what comes out right now is a function of what came out in past time. So it's very recursive in nature. What this means is if that I put in a single impulse into this system, so if I just put in delta of k, what comes out as a function of time is a function of those previous inputs, and you're gonna end up with an impulse response that lasts forever. It, that recursive nature, the impulse response will never completely die out. It might be tending to zero, but due to this part of the equation right here, you'll end up with an impulse response that goes on for forever. Another way of saying that, that's not quite as clear from this, but is an important thing to note, is that when we're dealing with IIR filters, we can put their poles at very arbitrary locations. Putting those poles at some arbitrary location in the complex plane means that I have some time domain term of that pole raised to the K. So let's say, for example, the pole is at point three. Point three of a pole location in the Z domain is gonna end up corresponding to something like point three to the K in the time domain impulse response of the system. So point three to the K just goes on for forever, right? It's decaying, it's tending to zero, but never quite gets to zero. So the kind of key thing about IIR filters is their output is a function of previous outputs. Their impulse response lasts for forever. They never completely die out. And in terms of their pole locations, you can put poles wherever you would like. 
FIR filters are a little bit different. So again, let's kind of talk about finite impulse response filters from the perspective of a specific transfer function to begin with. Let's say that this is my transfer function. Going back to the time domain, this would be my corresponding difference equation in the time domain that relates the current output to a function of the current input, f of k, and previous inputs, f of k minus 1, f of k minus 2, and f of k minus 3. Something changed here, right? Right now, my output is only a function of previous inputs and current inputs. There's no relationship on my current output to any previous outputs. So we say that this filter is not recursive. My output does not depend on previous outputs. It only depends on, as a function of inputs. What that means is if I put in an impulse into this system, and if I wait long enough, in this case, if I wait you know, out here about three units in time, eventually the output of the system will actually go to zero. Because of that, we call this a finite impulse response system. The impulse response is only on for a finite amount of time, opposed to the IIR filters whose impulse responses are on for an infinite amount of time. Another interesting thing about this that you can see by looking here is that the denominator term has a z cubed, which means that it does have poles. It has a third order pole at the origin. And in fact, FIR filters only have poles at the origin. Their pole locations have to be at z equals zero. So if you're ever looking at a pole zero plot and you see poles that are not at the origin, you know that system must be an IRR system. If you're looking at a pole zero plot of a system and you only see poles at the origin, then you know that the system is an FIR filter or an FIR system. All right, so that's some good terminology to review before we get into our specific approaches for designing discrete time filters. And we'll do that in the next two videos. In the first video, we'll look at a time domain criteria for designing filters. Basically, how can we design an H of K to mimic the impulse response H of T of a continuous time system? And then in the final video in this first playlist, we'll look at a frequency domain approach. How can I design a transfer function H of Z that has similar characteristics to the frequency response of a continuous time system? So stay tuned for those videos.